So alcohol uh, withdrawals. Okay. Uh, before before we start, uh, or or before we kind of go into the actual management, you have to kind of know a little bit about the actual withdrawal. Yani, uh, you have to know what exactly are the symptoms of withdrawal and what are the risk factors. Usually, risk factors is you know it comes with age. You know, somebody who's forty um, might have a higher risk of withdrawal than somebody who's young, who's like twenty and drinks. Um, chronicity of the drinking. If they've been drinking for 10 or 20 years, the withdrawal symptoms might be worse. And the most important thing is uh, if they ever had a seizure uh, or if they ever had severe withdrawal. So, you know, high age, think more than 40 is the, is the kind of cutoff when you start thinking of severe withdrawal. Um, uh, chronicity of the drinking. And then Finally, if they have a history of, uh, of a severe withdrawal. What do you call severe alcohol withdrawal? When they start seizing and they start having, uh, de- you know, they become delirious. Do you know the, the term? Delirium tremens. Delirium tremens, okay. So DT. Essentially, you have to ask or you have to dig into the history and see if the patient ever had delirium tremens. And, and this, is, this is probably the most important one because... It is it is predictor of whether the patient might have delirium tremens or not. Okay, the other thing you need to know is the risk for withdrawal. Um, it it starts uh, increasing after the last drink and then goes down. Which means um, again, if you have you know this is your time, and then uh, the patient you know he's drinking alcohol here. By the way, you might see this ETOH, it just means ethanol or alcohol. People use this a lot. Um, and then let's say <clears throat> at this point was last drink. So this time of last drink should be documented. So it's really important to document when was the patient's last drink. Because after the last drink, you start counting the risk for DT, essentially. You're trying to mitigate the risk for DT. You're trying to prevent um, uh, the patient from from going into delirium tremens or going into severe alcohol withdrawal. And the risk usually, if this is, you know, this is hour zero, then you have like 24 hours here and then 48 hours and then, I don't know, uh, 72 hours. The risk usually starts at six hours. So, and then it's the highest around 48 hours and then kind of goes down okay so once you hit that 48 hour mark so two days later uh, it's going to be the highest risk for people to to have seizure or to have um, delirium tremens <clears throat> okay so most of the time most of the time um, these patients you know they might present to you kind of here around this period of time you know presentation and this is when you're going to start managing them, okay? Usually, you know, admission to the hospital. Another question, does everybody who have alcohol with, who has alcohol withdrawal need to be admitted? What do you think? I would say no, it depends, but most most of the people who do have visible alcohol withdrawal probably need to be admitted, okay? Uh, and <clears throat> obviously, if you have more risk factors, you will have a lower threshold to admit them, to get them to the hospital and admit them, okay? All right, very simple. So people present, you know, the patient presents with alcohol, with what looks like alcohol withdrawal, last drink was yesterday, and, you know, they present with what looks like, you know, visible withdrawal uh, signs, okay? So when you're talking about um, withdrawal uh, signs and symptoms, Usually, you know, it's agitation, you've got like headaches, nausea, um, and then the worst thing is delirium and seizures. Okay, so it's a spectrum, right? So you've got a spectrum. And uh, it's very subjective, right? So somebody might have headaches and you'll say, okay, they have mild withdrawal. Some people might have uh, seizures and you're saying this is severe withdrawal. But because it's so subjective, 
um, uh, they created a score or they created like a, a, sc a scoring system just like everything in medicine you know we create scoring system for for the withdrawal and this this system uh, is specifically used for alcohol withdrawal and you have to know this you don't have to memorize the scale you just have to know the name of it it's called the CWA protocol specifically CWA or AR but the CWA protocol is the protocol or is the grading system that was created to objectively um, say whether the patient is having mild or moderate or severe withdrawals okay the score goes from 0 to 46 or something and what you need to know is that if the score is above uh, or equal to 20 then this is uh, a high risk for DT okay so this is the magic number is 20 now when you are in your hospital 20 might not be their magic number because what they might say we don't want to we don't want to wait until the patient is at 20 maybe let's once the patient is 15 we'll consider them they have severe alcohol withdrawal uh, symptoms so uh, this number really depends this number depends on the institute but in general like objectively speaking from a medical standpoint 20 is the highest it starts having a very high risk for dts okay the other question for you, if somebody Siwa is 20, okay, they're coming with alcohol withdrawal, the last drink was yesterday, and now the Siwa score is 20. What do you th where do you think this patient should be managed? In the floors, in the ICU, in, on the, in the ER, and then sent home? What do you think? Um, I would say ICU. Definitely ICU. These people, because they're very high risk of seizures, um, then uh, they should be monitored like Q2 hour. what Q2 hours, Q, you know, 10, 20 minutes sometimes, you know, you just need to keep an eye on them. One to one, you'll have a nurse like just watching the patient at all times because of the high risk uh, of DTs. Okay. Um, so this, this indicates ICU admission usually. Okay, cool. So now, you know, they, they showed up you kind of estimated or guesstimated the risk for alcohol withdrawal, you admitted them to the floor, okay? You said this person has mild, this person has moderate, this person has severe, whatever, okay? Now you admit them to the floor, and now you want to start uh, your management. So what is the management of alcohol withdrawal in one word? Benzos. Benzos, exactly. So benzos. You, this is the preferred and the most effective method uh, although some hospitals might have a, a phenobarbital uh, protocol. Okay. There's others, uh, but the one you should be familiar with is the benzos. Um, the phenobarb might not be available in uh, everybody. It might not be used by everybody unless the hospital you're at sees a lot of alcohol. They might have different protocols. The, <clears throat> the electronic medical system or the EMR that you're using, especially if you're using Epic or whatever, it makes it simple because most of the time uh, there is an order set and the order set is very simple. You just click um, mild, uh, mild, uh, mild withdrawal and then you just order it as is and then you're done. Essentially, it orders it for you. But you should know exactly what are the available things, uh, you know, um, that you, you should be using in terms of benzos. Okay. Remember, a uh, <clears throat> very important thing is that somebody, especially if somebody having moderate, so if somebody having moderate or, or severe um, withdrawal, remember that these people are, because they're withdrawing from alcohol, you can't cut off the alcohol completely. You will increase the risk of seizures. So remember that they will need some sort of, you know, benzos in their system to um, to to mitigate the withdrawal symptoms. So it's almost like, <clears throat> remember when we talked about DKA, <clears throat> you need like a basal insulin and then, you know, you get these, you, you take these spikes. If you're hyperglycemic, you give them like more insulin. It's almost like that, except that you're going slowly and you're, you're taking it down as time progresses. So really what you can do is uh, when you imagine it, think of it as, as, you know, you're giving them some sort of, you know, basal um, benzos and then slowly going down on it. And then in between, you're giving them boluses, you know, as needed, kind of. 
So uh, this is the way you want to think about it. Important, if you put somebody on benzos PRN, which means just as needed, they might, I mean, they might seize. Because if you don't have this basal, uh, this basal level of benzos, they will have nothing in their system in this, in this kind of period of time. And <clears throat> if, you, if you're just counting on giving them um, PRN, then they might seize. So you really have to be careful with that. Okay. The other thing is that uh, some people uh, advocate ju again, just like uh, just like diabetes. There is like a proactive and there is reactive. Proactive meaning you anticipate that the patient will have some sort of CWA score, or you want to prevent them from having a higher CWA score, so you give them benzos before they even become, uh, you know, agitated or whatever. While reactive is you wait until the CWA score goes up and then you give them the, the medicine. Okay. By the way, this proactive versus reactive, um, this is not just for DKA and alcohol withdrawal. This is for everything, including like in in my world, like when we treat uh, patients with IBD. We have the same, similar kind of idea, like proactive management versus reactive, uh, step up versus step down, uh, and it's debate. There's a lot of debate about these things, so you don't need to know, but you just keep it in mind. Okay, okay. So what benzos do we have? What is the what is the benzos um, the the big one, the most important one that you should know? Do you know the 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 most? Chlordiazepoxide. Chlordiazepoxide. It's one of them, but it's not the most important one. Diazepam. Okay, so diazepam, but that's not that's not the one. Lorazepam. Lorazepam. Lorazepam is the one that you should know, and then there is one more, oxazepam. Okay. Now, lorazepam everybody knows, uh, but the rest of these like oxazepam, oxazepam, uh, chlor diazepoxide, and diazepam. People will, will talk about them, but, but again, because you're in the U.S., everybody is going to be using tra trade names, not generic names. So you should know the trade name. Lorazepam is Ativan. Oxazepam is Cirax. Chlordiazepoxide is Librium. And then Diazepam is Valium. Everybody likes to use trade names and... You, you barely you will you'll never hear somebody saying oxazepam everybody's gonna say cirax okay now <clears throat> the differences between them is important because uh both of these so uh let's say iv po right lorazepam can be given iv and can be given po okay that's what's nice about it is you can do iv and you can do po form okay oxazepam is only po Chlordiazepoxide is only PO, and diazepam is both. You can do IV and you can do PO. Okay, but usually um, they do it. They do it IV if needed. Okay. Now, depending on where you again, depending on where you go, most people are gonna use um, lorazepam, and you know, exchangeably maybe Cirax or Librium. Exchangeably, I, I don't know which one they're they're, they're gonna use in your institute, but and for me, the ones I I used were um, was uh, oxazepam, not chlordiazepoxide. An important thing to remember is that chlordiazepoxide uh, has active metabolites, um, and it needs it, it needs a, a good it needs a good liver function. It needs a good liver to work. Otherwise, uh, not to work, to uh, metabolize. Otherwise, there will be prolonged half-life. So uh, just be careful uh, when you're using Librium in people with, <clears throat> with um, chronic liver disease, people with alcoholic hepatitis. Um, they, they say don't use it, essentially. Okay. So essentially, this one I would avoid in bad liver. Regardless, what, what does that mean? You know, it means either alcoholic hepatitis, it means somebody who's cirrhotic. Try to avoid it. Don't give it. So that's why I like to use oxazepam. Oh, and the way I remember it is that, you know, L for liver and librium, you know. So it's easy for you to remember. Okay, so now you know the, the formulations. Now, how are you actually going to treat 
those people. Um, so usually uh, the oxazepam and uh, chlordazepoxide, the Cirax and Librium, they're PO and they're usually, you know, Q6 to 8 hours you're giving those patients, okay? While lorazepam, the PO form, you can do Q2 hours <clears throat> and the IV form, you can do Q, you know, 15 minutes. You can just give it every 15 minutes. In fact, some people even put them on a drip of lorazepam uh, or diazepam, same thing. Okay, so the IV forms you can just give them. So the way the way I do it again, remember this graph. Uh, <clears throat> the way you want to do it is you want to have some sort of standing dose. Standing just means like scheduled that it's it's gonna be given at certain intervals. Okay, plus you're gonna have a PRN dose, and then plus minus others which means other therapies that you might you might want to you might want to use okay so <clears throat> how exactly does this work so the way that this works is it depending depends on the patient and i think the easiest the easiest way is to give you an example so let's let's give an example so um let's say it's a 50 year old male okay uh who uh, presents presents with um <laughs> Uh, alcohol withdrawal okay just to make it just make it easy and then last drink was um, was 24 hours ago okay so he walks into the ER and in the ER the Siwa uh, was uh, 10 10 meaning you know it's not really 20 <clears throat> but it's not far away from 14 15 which the risk starts going up so he's not really at risk of DT and no history of DT. So you can consider them mild to moderate alcohol withdrawal. Okay, so this is kind of mild, moderate withdrawal. Okay, so again, remember, how are we going to manage this? First of all, this patient is, you know, they're, uh, they're awake. They're not, they're not, you know, they might be grumpy, but they're, they're awake and, and they can talk. And most importantly, they can swallow. Okay, so they can take PO, all right? So can take PO. That's, that's really important to assess because a lot of people <clears throat> who alcohol withdrawal might show up with, um, you know, comatose or they're not awake, they're intubated. You can't give them PO. So this guy can take PO. So what do you think? How can we manage? Let's uh, kind of, now knowing that you have some CWA scores or you have everything else, what do you think is... How do you think the management can go? Are you going to give them Ativan, uh, Librium? Anybody? Uh, ideas? So there's no right or wrong. Again, you might have an order set and your, your hospital just makes it easier for you. But if you don't, then you need to kind of figure it out. And the way you do it is... This CWA score that the patient has, you know that it's going to change throughout the day. It might go up, it might go down, okay, depending. So you really need to have uh, an idea about what to do for every, um, for every CWA. So here's what you do. So you're going to do your standing. Remember, we talked about standing. So let's say you do your standing dose and you say, okay, I'm going to start Cirax, um, 30 milligrams, Q8 hours, okay? And this is PO, okay? So this, this is the standing dose, and this is the most important thing. This is your basal insulin, you know? This is your basal benzos that you're giving them. Then you're going to put the PRN uh, orders, and the PRN orders are going to be depending on the amount of withdrawal. So what you can do is <clears throat> you can give them extra CRX, for example, um, like 15 milligrams, uh, if CWA is above 6, let's say. And then you can say, give CRAX 30 milligrams <clears throat> if CWA uh, is above, uh, let's say, uh, 8. Okay, so it, it might be like that. And then the, the final one is uh, you can say, give lorazepam or Ativan, like two milligrams 
IV, remember, if Siwa is above like 10, okay? So now what you did here is that you gave you gave uh, the the patient uh, some sort of you know PRN doses depending on the CWA, and if the CWA is high, the higher it goes, then the 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 the, the, the you know kind of the bigger the gun that you're using to try to control it, and then this thing you know usually if on the floor, right, you can do this uh, Q four hours. At most. If you want to do something more than Q4 hours, then then you're doing something. Uh, then you can't do it on the floor. You have to send them to the ICU or step down. Um, what people do usually is that this standing dose, eventually, you know, in day on day two or day three, they go down to 15 milligrams. Then that's it. Then discharge. Okay. So this is how you know they're they're out of the they're out of the withdrawal kind of window, out of 48 hours. Essentially, you want to get them to day three. And then, you know, they'll be fine. Okay? That's very important. One more thing. Okay? One more thing. Let's just do another case. Because this case is simple, right? You put this and the patient is probably going to be fine. Okay? Uh, another case. A 50-year-old male uh, was found down. Okay? So this patient was actually, you know, he's down. And he is uh, intubated because of airway protection. Um, and uh, last drink, unknown. And then the alcohol in the blood is above 200 or something. Okay? Awesome. How are you going to manage this person? Where are they, first of all, where are they going to be admitted? To the ICU. ICU. Of course. Yeah, they're intubated. They need vent management. They're going to the ICU. Okay? Awesome. So, for this for this person, because the last drink is unknown, you really need to treat the withdrawals. But unfortunately, you, you know you're you you can't assess the CWA score at this point. Are you gonna give them? What do you think? Are you gonna give them uh, Ativan? You're not gonna give them Ativan. First of all, no PO, right? No PO. You can't give them PO. But then the other question is: Are you gonna give them uh, some benzos or you're not? What do you think? We have to give them benzos, I guess, but on regular intervals. Yeah, you have to give them benzos. So, the, I mean, he's at high risk of withdrawal and you don't know what happened. I mean, maybe he actually seized and that's what happened. Okay, maybe that's the presentation of DT. So you really have to get, you, you have to put them on lorazepam. And, you know, you can, you can do either uh, two milligrams, um, like uh, IV Q2 hours or something, or Q4 hours. You just have to give them some sort of benzos in the system, okay? So let's continue the scenario. Uh, the patient wakes up, okay? He's intubated, and then he starts fighting the vent, okay? His respiratory rate goes up to 40, um, and he's, you know, he's trying, trying to self-extubate. So at this point, you know that, you know, they're either severely withdrawing or they're delirious, and they're going to DTs, okay? So now what do you do? So now you give them more benzos. You really need to give them a lot of benzos. So what you can do is, number one, either do lorazepam, um, two milligrams, Q15 minutes until he chills, IV. Or you can do a diazepam um, drip. Or... You can you you can in this setting you can use a short acting drip. So diazepam is a long acting drip. There's a short acting benzo that we didn't discuss before called midazolam. And midazolam, you need to know the trade name. It's called Versed. Okay, drip. You can put them on a Versed drip. Okay, um, and this this just very fast acting. And it will work well, okay? Another tidbit, these people uh, who get Ativan, like this person, how much do you think the maximum dose um, of lorazepam you might end up giving? Like you're giving Q15 minutes or Q10 minutes, whatever. You're giving 2 milligrams, 2 milligrams, 2 milligrams, 2 milligrams. 
how much do you think like uh, these people might require like if you wanna guess any guess just uh, hold on like a hundred milligrams max or two hundred milligrams what do you think it's actually they might require massive doses they might require sometimes requiring more than 2000 milligrams if you read the case reports about people who are withdrawing and even if you read the up-to-date articles some people require like 2600 milligrams of Ativan to actually calm down so remember these chronic alcoholics the benzos you know they they just they can't uh, it doesn't affect them that much not like person uh, people who don't drink okay uh, another important thing, just uh, before, just like kind of we end it, these people who are fighting the vent and these people who are agitated because of the alcohol, what you can do, you can give them a, an alpha-2 um, agonist. Alpha-2 agonist, uh, do you know an example of an alpha-2 agonist? Clonidine? Clonidine. Remember, it's a, sympath a sympatho uh, sympatholytic, Okay. The, 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 the main one is clonidine, but you can't really give clonidine. Clonidine is PO. So there's an IV form. It's called dexmeditomidine, something like that. Okay. No one calls it that. People call it presidex. Okay. And it's a drip. You can put them on a presidex drip. It will calm them down. But remember, remember, remember that... The Presidex alone does not treat alcohol withdrawal. So you might put them on Presidex, but you have to you have to have them on benzos as well. Okay. So if you if you put anybody on Presidex, they will calm down. Okay. So it masks it masks the 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 siwa, the symptoms of withdrawal, but does not does nothing for DTs. Okay. So this is very important that if you start somebody on this, especially in the ICU, you might. I mean, I've seen this mistake happen where people get admitted to the ICU and the patients on Presidex all night long and they're fine, they're calm, but they're not, they're not getting treated for the alcohol withdrawal, okay? Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, with all these things, these people who present with alcohol, the, the, the other therapies you might use is you want to make sure you give them IV thiamine because most of these people will be B1 deficient and this will prevent the development of Wernicke or, or uh, Korsakoff later on. Um, and then IV thymine plus glucose once you need to give them like uh, IV glucose. And then once you know they're awake, you put them on PO multivitamin. Um, and then before discharge, what are you gonna do? You're gonna you know, send, send them to addiction medicine. That's usually only if they're willing to quit, you know, like a lot of people are going to, you're going to discharge them, they're going to go back home, they're going to drink again. And it's like a cycle, okay? But in general, this is how you manage kind of the mild, moderate versus severe alcohol withdrawal. And again, your institute might have it simple and they might have a protocol. You just click one box and then you're good to go. And then other people, other institutes might have it, you know, might not have it at all. And you'll have to do it by yourself.